Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Kathy Tai. I'm the Deputy Regional Director for our Asia and the Pacific Program here at Center for International Private Enterprise, CIPE. Welcome to today's discussion. This is the fourth and final meeting of this event series hosted by CIPE and our partners across Asia Pacific on how to turn corrosive capital into constructive capital. This series is focused on mitigating governance gaps and neutralizing risks so the recipient countries can be more ready to embrace capital inflow and inbound investments. Foreign investors and recipient countries are experiencing large infrastructure deficit and tremendous opportunities for growth. Saipa and its partners have been working together over the past few years, try to find ways to make large scale infrastructure projects more transparent and more accountable. Even more importantly, these projects have to address the needs of local communities and they have to take into account of local perspectives. However, these are the areas that are often overlooked. So now I would like to give you a quick introduction of what Saip and his partners have done over the years to address these issues through a few slides. So now you see the BRI monitor uh, web page. This is an initiative that Saip and its partners have worked together for the past two years. So we started a few years ago to try to map out economic footprint of Chinese investments because our partners are seeing BRI projects flooding into the region. That was a project we started about five years ago. And one problem that is pretty omnipresent is the lack of transparency and lack of information. Partners have pointed out that these are the most problematic area, and they would love to find out more on how to better monitor public procurement in large infrastructure projects, because these are the sore points in their opinions. So about two years ago, we started this project, and it's a regional initiative that seeks to advocate for greater transparency and accountability by identifying governance gaps associated with Chinese funded projects. We're working with five partners on this initiative. They are Ideas of Malaysia, Strat-based ADRI of the Philippines, the Institute of National Affairs from Papua New Guinea, who will join us today, Future Forum from Cambodia, and Sandy Governance Institute uh, from Myanmar. And uh, next slide, uh, I would love to show you uh, a heat map. So um, the BRI model pilot project includes descriptive case studies. Um, and the image that you're seeing right now is a, a transparency heat map that assesses the transparency of BRI projects based on 38 data points that according to international best practices, they should be proactively disclosed by host countries. The transparency assessments of BRI projects produced as part of the BRI monitor help identify consistent governance gaps, which then informs the prioritization of policy advocacy in areas where it can do the most immediate good. The results of the transparency assessment for each data point in each case study are presented on the BRI monitor website using a color-coded scale. The heat map developed through this project, which I hope uh, you are as impressed as I am, identifies uh, specific types of information that government should and could release to improve their transparency scores and allow advocates to compare current government procurement procedures against internationally recognized best practices. And for civic advocates, looking at the heat map helps them see the red flags more easily, identify gaps that are in need of attention and highlight elements of the project process that consistently lack transparency across case studies. So um, today's discussion, we are going to feature Papua New Guinea, PNG, 
PNG is the most populous country of the Pacific Island nations um, with a population of around 9 million people. We will have Peter Connolly, uh, who is currently completing his PhD on Chinese, invest, on Chinese interest in Melanesia, drawing on extensive research in China, PNG, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, Fiji, and Timor-Leste. Uh, he has done extensive research on China's interest and influence across Melanesia as the presence has increased under uh, Xi Jinping's leadership, including the arrival of a Bering Road Initiative into the region. And then we will have uh, Jake Hamstra, who is the Chief Communications Officer at East West Center where he directs the Department of Communications and External Relations and leads the coordination of communications engagement strategy and activities across the center. Jake previously served as special advisor to the president with a particular emphasis on strategic communication and Pacific Islands programs. We then will uh, play a recorded uh, video of um, Paul Bakker from uh, Institute of National Affairs. Hopefully they will be able to join us today. Um, I, uh, PNG often has a pretty choppy connection. So um, we're hoping that um, they will be able to join us later for the Q&A session. So uh, now um, after the introduction of the panelists, I'm going to hand over um, the floor to Peter. And then so uh, Peter, Jake, and then um, representative from INA will give initial uh, remarks. After that, we will follow with Q&A um, from uh, the audience. So um, for participants, feel free to uh, type and enter your question at any given moment, and then we will collect them and then we will um, ask them uh, to the, the panelists uh, towards the end. So if you have specific question for a specific panelist, also please uh, mark it in your question. So thank you so much. And then Peter, it's your um, time. Thanks very much, Kathy. And uh, hello, everyone. Good evening to, to most of you. Um, what I'm gonna do is just start by talking about a particular part of my research, which focused on Papua New Guinea, which is the, the largest, most populous, most resource rich of the Pacific Islands. Uh, and Kathy mentioned the, the, the word Melanesia as a subregion. I'll just show you the map behind me. If you can see that, there's Papua New Guinea. We have the Solomons, which you might have heard about in the news in the last week, uh, Vanuatu and Fiji, uh, the other independent states within Melanesia. And of course, we have New Caledonia. Uh, which is un under France. Um, but what I'm gonna do is talk to you about four conversations that I had in Papua New Guinea in 2019. I had spent quite a bit of time there previously, but I was invited back by a friend of mine saying, hey, everything has changed since you did your research in 2017. And the reason was that the Belt and Road uh, was introduced in 2018. And just to mention how that happened, 2018 was a big year in Melanesia because Papua New Guinea hosted APEC, which was a, a pretty big deal for that country. Uh, and as part of that, the Chinese uh, president came, which was the first time that had ever happened in Papua New Guinea. Uh, so Xi Jinping uh, arrived in Papua New Guinea. And as part of those uh, meetings that happened in late 2018, he held meetings with the leaders uh, of all of the Pacific Islands that recognize the One China policy uh, as a separate event. Uh, and that was really where all of them ended up joining the Belt and Road, signing uh, memorandums of understanding by the end of that activity. Uh, so th these conversations that I had, uh, I note three out of four were with Chinese people, uh, which I think when we're talking about the Belt and Road, not a lot of that happens now, particularly on the ground in the country where it's been delivered. Now, my first conversation was with an official and I asked that official, so how do you define a Belt and Road Initiative project? And this is you know, when, when the 
The concept has been going for six years at this stage, uh, and it's still pretty ropey. People are still pretty unclear what this means. And he said, okay, you've heard about the five connectivities. In case you haven't, that's trade, infrastructure, policy, people, and finance. Now, to me, those connectivities are kind of everything. So that's not really giving me a definition, but he said, if a project complies with the five connectivities, it is a Belt and Road Initiative project. So I go, okay, does that mean if the project started before the Belt and Road was even mentioned or the OBOR was mentioned, it can still be a BRI project? He said, yes. So I could have started 10 years before, it could still be a Belt and Road project. Interesting. I then said, can a Belt and Road project be paid for by another country than China? He said, absolutely. The more, the better, uh, which was interesting as well. Um, and I'll get to later how a lot of multinational institutions who are paying for the Belt and Road. Um, and then, uh, so I guess my conclusion from that first conversation was, Almost any project that a Chinese company is working on can be regarded as a Belt and Road Initiative project. And for the people in that country, uh, they probably don't care. They just, they, they want the outcome from the project, right? Um, but in terms of the geopolitics that Cathy was mentioning earlier, that's a big deal. So interesting. The second conversation uh, was with a new Chinese uh, member of, of the Papua New Guinean community who'd been there for, for quite a while, uh, for about three decades. And uh, one, one of the things I was told by this uh, business person was that Chinese state-owned enterprises tend to arrive in Papua New Guinea for a major uh, project or task. Uh, the example I was given was the 2015 Pacific Games, where a lot of the facilities for that were built by Chinese companies. But then they stay on. And that when they stay on, the numbers of state-owned enterprises were increasing within Papua New Guinea, and they're all undercutting the local pop, uh, competition, but they're undercutting each other as well, is, is a, a real theme of these discussions. They're very competitive with each other, and they're, you know, they're trying to survive. The next point was that uh, but to, I asked, okay, so how many, how many state-owned enterprises were there here in Papua New Guinea when the Belt and Road MOU was signed in 2018, the answer was 21. Uh, and this is now exactly 12 months later. I said, how many are there now? 39. So we've gone from probably what was saturation of the market uh, before signing the MOU to well over saturation, doubling the number in 12 months. Uh, then uh, moving on from that conversation, uh, where, where that individual said China's aims were political and economic influence, uh, which was interesting as well. I then spoke to um, a very senior member of a state-owned enterprise, and it was a privilege to have this discussion, I might, I might add. Uh, this individual said it was fairly disparaging of, of the BRI. Obviously, I'm protecting my sources here. Uh, but the quote I have here is, uh, the BRI is a loud announcement of China's rise. So from this particular individual's point of view, and it could have just been the way they were pitching to me, uh, everything was happening already. Everything was going nicely. Uh, the announcement of the Belt and Road from this SOE's point of view scared off a lot of people and has caused problems. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the work goes on. And this particular individual said that they work closely with the commercial and economic counselor's office in the embassy. Uh, so there's a coordination aspect there of some type. Uh, but most importantly, he said, we are businessmen, but we are state-owned businessmen, which is something I'd heard people talk about for years, but I'd never actually heard a senior member of a state-owned enterprise say that. And the point that was being made is, hey, I can, if I can see the most logical economic path for my company to pursue, but I'm told there is something that is not economically logical, but strategically valuable, and I can be told to go and do that. So that's interesting. But the final thing from that conversation was that China Harbour Engineering Company uh, in its projects in Papua New Guinea is 90% doing 
Asian Development Bank projects uh, and, uh, and another uh, prominent state-owned enterprise, uh, China Civil Engineering, uh, known as CCECC in Vanuatu, 75% of its projects are with the World Bank. Uh, so this whole idea of, okay, so we've got multinationals paying for what is ostensibly Belt and Road projects for, for the major companies delivering the most uh, infrastructure in, in Melanesia and the Pacific. The final uh, conversation, I realise I'm starting to go over time, uh, I had to go to the Asian Development Bank. So this was not with a, a Chinese individual, um, but I was told there that at the time, so in 2019, 80% of Asian Development Bank infrastructure projects, so they have a lot of others, they've got health and other things, but infrastructure, 80% of it was with Chinese state-owned enterprises in 2019. Now, this individual said that the, the way most of the SOEs operate is that they make an offer in the tender process that tends to be 30% below the engineer's estimate, which is, to me, cost price or close to. Uh, obviously, other companies from other countries just can't compete with that. But furthermore, they're trying to undercut each other. Uh, and so a company may create a number of subsidiaries and put in offers for them as well, just to flood that tender process and get the price down uh, with the aim of them taking the project. Now, I'll just add that um, in terms of A, and this is using Lowy data on the Pacific for 2019, for Papua New Guinea in that year, their aid was 49.6% from Australia, 16.7% from ADB, and 7.7% from China. Uh, and I guess the picture I was getting was that there is a large amount of what China had been contributing in previous years has become uh, carried by the ADB in that country. And it, it varies from island to island. So that this whole Asian Development Bank thing is very much a Papua New Guinea thing uh, from my analysis. Uh, okay, so just to quickly conclude, um, under the Belt and Road, China doesn't necessarily stand to gain a lot of economic benefit in the Pacific Islands. So it does raise the question, and I've had Melanesians raise this with me right back since 2014, uh, that if China does bring the Belt and Road to Melanesia, why is it doing it? And the, the view is often there's other reasons. Um, I've got to put in a point about Melanesian agency. Firstly, at the state level, uh, where there is a lot of well-educated, very smart people uh, who are looking at the national interest, they're after cheap infrastructure. They're also after leverage and they're after strategic balancing. And this is giving it to them. So they see positives in the Belt and Road, but at the same time, they're wary about other issues, uh, such as what, what is the other objectives of China in making these deals. Um, but in, in the short term, they just desperately need the infrastructure to develop. But then taking it down a level, looking at local level agency, there's a lot of traditional power structures that resent the Chinese presence. And I think what happened in the Solomons last week is, is a partial demonstration of that. But most of the examples I've looked at are smaller areas where they virtually banned Chinese businesses from operating because they're worried about the microeconomy uh, and what, what Chinese small business will do in that microeconomy. Um, so it's important to consider the Melanesian perspective on all of this. But overall, I would say um, to me, and particularly from this example in Papua New Guinea, uh, China is using economic tools often to achieve geopolitical goals. And that means that to me, the Belt and Road Initiative is a geoeconomic program. And clearly as part of that, China is very happy for others to pay for its influence. Thanks, Cathy.
Thanks, Peter, uh, for sharing some of this very staggering statistics. Uh, that was just a lot to unpack. I, I, I definitely will come back to you and then ask some follow up questions on um, like how China is using the economic tools to achieve their political goals. Uh, we, we, we will discuss a little bit more later. And now uh, that's uh, hand this over to Jake. Thank you, Kathy. Um... Hello everyone, uh, aloha and uh, good afternoon or evening, or morning from Hawaii, uh, wherever you may be. Um, I just want to thank the Center for International Private Enterprise, Kathy and your colleagues um, for organizing today. A uh, real honor to, to join you and your, your audience. Um, I also wanted to start out by clarifying that I'm by no means a Papua New Guinea expert. Um, uh, like Peter, actually most of my work in the, in the Pacific has been in Micronesia in the North Pacific. Um, so I worked there for a few years, um, and then now at the East West Center, I'm working on several um, Pacific projects, including a, a large USAID funded effort to support good governance, um, including financial governance that's sort of across the entire region. So I think I'll be speaking at a little bit of a, a broader level and maybe in the, um, you know, if the title for today was Papua New Guinea and the Pacific, I'll, I'll try to cover off the and the Pacific part uh, a, a bit more. Um, and I'm talking specifically about the small island states, um, the challenges that they're uh, facing and sort of the, the branch of the BRI that, that's called the Maritime Silk Road is definitely um, present and expanding in the, um, the uh, smaller specific islands area. So um, I thought what I wanted to do very quickly today is um, talk about two things. First, to lay out some of the challenges related to capital investment inflows in the Pacific Islands uh, region, um, you know, uh, not so much Melanesia and Papua New Guinea, large economies, but the smaller um, areas of, of the region, the smaller states, um, and China's role in those. And then secondly, just talk real quickly about how these issues can, can be addressed and then, you know, as a basis for, for the discussion going forward. So um, first, um, I guess what I would call the financial governance challenge in the, in the Pacific Islands, you know, why are there these concerns about corrosive capital, um, at least in, in those parts of, of the region? And I think that's, it's really a product of, of two overarching factors. Um, the first factor is kind of stating the obvious, but um, it's just the dramatic increase in, um, especially in potential investment uh, inflows and aid inflows. Um, and obviously there are, are a few driver of those, but really linked to, to two trends in the area that I've been following most closely and, and, and China is part of both of them. Um, again, the, the, the real obvious one, one that Peter touched on quite a bit is the increased strategic rivalry in the region. Um, especially in, in the, the Pacific Islands, the more far-flung areas of it, the, that maritime space, obviously really strategically important to both the U.S. and its allies and China and other countries with interests in the region. And that's leading to increasing influence seeking and, and a part of that will be um, greater inflows, uh, more investment. And then the other trend I think that it's worth mentioning on this front um, is the vulnerability to climate change, especially in those smaller specific islands, many of which are only a few feet above sea level in some cases. And that really this is the front line of the effort to combat climate change and what that means um, following, for example, COP26, I think that we're gonna see really large inflows of, of climate mitigation investment um, and aid sort of uh, complementing the, the strategic interest and, and the capital inflows that, that come there. So um, in terms of China's role in the picture of capital inflows into the Pacific Islands, the, the parts that, that I'm more focusing on, um, obviously, numerically speaking, uh, as uh, going from Lowy Institute data that, that Peter also referenced, um, most of China's capital investment in the region is concentrated in PNG, obviously the biggest economy, the largest population, and any amounts flowing elsewhere are not huge in absolute terms. Um, but I think it, it, they're still important because they're large relative to the size of, of those smaller Pacific Islands uh, economies. Um, and they mean that despite the, the small absolute numbers, uh, China is still the top bilateral lender to the Pacific region. Um, that's talking, this is talking about loans, um, not aid. Obviously, uh, Australia, especially Australia and New Zealand, uh, dominate on the aid front. Um, but after the, the ADB, China is um, the largest lender, and most of this is, is infrastructure project, even in those smaller economies. Um, and that means that, in turn, they account for a significant portion of the debt, uh, the public debt of a lot of, of, of those states, such as Tonga, um, Vanuatu, uh, several others. So. Um, Peter touched on this at the end of, at the end of his remarks, but I think it's worth uh, noting and just thinking about this corrosive capital issue going forward that China's investment in, in the smaller specific uh, 
island states is also likely to um, continue to trend up. And that's really based on, because it's based on multiple factors that are, that are not going away. Um, and I, I like to call these the three P's, um, makes it easier to remember. Um, one is, uh, and that's ports, politics, and protein. So the ports, this is the geostrategic um, control of, or access to maritime space issue. Politics is really about Taiwan, um, uh, a preponderance of, of the states that still recognize uh, Taiwan as, uh, as China are in the Pacific and, and China would like to change that situation. Um, and then protein refers to tuna fisheries, um, especially the maritime states that I'm, I'm focusing on. China really has a vast and expanding tuna fleet in, in the region. And so that's that, that third interest. Um, and then it's worth uh, also pointing out that uh, part of China's impact is not an interest is, uh, the impact of its interest is not just what China is doing, but the responses that it's, that it's uh, triggering so, or um, helping to to cause and you know other countries are upping their game in the Pacific. That's quite that's quite clear in the Pacific Islands area. The United States, obviously Australia, New Zealand, huge presence, but but also um, you know looking even more closely than before and increasing investments there. Um, although most of that again is aid through loans. So um, so that's really kind of the first factor I wanted to, to emphasize in terms of gross of capital risks in the broader Pacific. It's that increase in projected capital inflows. Um, and then the other one, kind of the other side of it is, is the financial government environment in a lot of these um, quite small states and the fairly significant challenges in absorbing those funds and putting them to good use. Um, I think you know, the, the financial governance ecosystems in a lot of the smaller Pacific Island states are fragile for a number of reasons. Um, you know, exacerbated by COVID, we now have nine Pacific countries at higher medium risk of debt distress, going to the Asian Development Bank. So, um, there's that. Um, there's also a, a lot of, uh, I know a lot of focus on with the BRI monitor um, and the work of organizations represented here is on infrastructure investments. And in, in the smaller states, there's that's definitely also taking place. Um, but there's also another side of things um, in terms of uh, investment and uh, influence uh, seeking that's around kind of building casinos, land deals, um, even cryptocurrency. And that, that's kind of another side of, of these inflows that's, that's worth exploring um, next to uh, infrastructure as well. Um, I guess there's, there's an issue as a region with the lack of investment standards and practices. Um, this is something that, that, that folks on this call are, are all working on, which is, which is fantastic, but still um, looking at the region as a whole the legislative regulatory frameworks are, are pretty patchy. Business environments are, are quite opaque. Um, I was just looking again at the ease of business rankings for the World Bank um, and the highest ranking Pacific Island state is, is Samoa at, at 98th. Um, so it's not, there's a lot of uh, uh, progress to, to be made there. Um, and then also just emphasizing the role of institutions because this connects to the government's piece, which is, which is what um, we work on here mostly. Um, there's a lot of room for more support for the institutions, especially in the smaller economies in the, in the Pacific who are charged with investigating, prosecuting um, financial crimes, betting investments, um, you know, uh, bring accountability and transparency to areas of potential corruption and so on. And a really important factor also in that, and it's been mentioned as well, is um, Peter and, and others, the, the civil society role, um, especially independent media. Um, and you know, it, uh, increasing awareness and involvement, especially in the policy process by parts of society, especially women that, are, that tend to be excluded from full, full participation in, in those, those areas. So, um, I mean, an example of this is that, unfortunately, there are four countries um, in the world that have no women in their legislatures, and, and three of those are, are in the Pacific Islands uh, region. Um, so that's kind of the big picture I want to present. I kind of on the end of and the rest of the Pacific front. You know, over the next several years, donors and partners um, expected to be pouring a lot more funds, investment into the region. On the other hand, the governance ecosystem that has to deal with those funds um, really facing some some challenges, and then also opportunities um, as to whether those those inflows, you know, on preponderance have negative impacts, instability as we've seen recently. Um, corruption in some places um, versus the positive impacts that they hope to also have enhancing stability 
better better livelihood. So um, just uh, realized uh, gone over already, but I, I did just also want to mention um, some key findings in a very general way on working on governance uh, issues in the Pacific that, that um, my colleagues and I have found um, at the East-West Center. So this is sort of this question of how to deal with these heightened risks. What can be done about, about corrosive capital? Um, obviously, it's always, I think, hazardous to make specific policy recommendations on a regional level or, um, or assume that they would apply in the same way to every country. Um, but I think one thing that's really worth emphasizing and that I think a consensus is emerging within regional organizations that, that we work with is that there needs to be a systemic approach. Um, so that's one where there's kind of mutually supporting efforts, multi-pronged efforts in the different areas of governance. So, um, you know, it's about political and policy on the, on the one side, um, establishing standards, trying to legislate them. Um, and then it's about the institutional structure, the watchdog agencies, um, empowering them to enforce those, those principles. Um, and then thirdly, the civil society aspect, demanding transparency, a big role for the media. Um, and, and so there's kind of these three prongs of, of, of governance. And um, as Kathy mentioned in the beginning, uh, I'm involved uh, and the East West Center is involved in a large USAID funded project across the Pacific Islands. Um, where we're really trying to implement uh, multiple activities that, that tackle some of these financial governance issues um, at the same time. Um, and I won't go over that now, maybe it'll come up in the discussion. I'll stick something in the chat for, for people who might be more interested, um, but I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. Uh, this is great to know that you are also working on economic governance issues. And then feel free to share more information and resources uh, in the chat box. Uh, more audience will love to uh, learn a little bit more about your program information as well. Um, and we could benefit from just, you know, have a discussion and dialogue like this and then to kind of compare notes. I think even that is super uh, helpful. So now I see that Paul and Flora are here with us. So uh, we are going to play uh, a recorded uh, remarks uh, by Paul and then I will, uh, after that, I will um, ask Flora to say a few words. Uh, Autumn? Can you please um, play the recorded message? Okay, I'm Paul Bakker. I'm the executive director of the Institute of National Affairs in Papua New Guinea, which is the largest uh, island nation in the Western Pacific outside Australia. The INA is a, an independent uh, public policy institute based here in PNG. PNG is a, a developing country with major geographical challenges with a widely dispersed population, mountainous and barrier terrain, including hundreds of islands. Uh, and its current infrastructure is basic and very costly to maintain and build. So there is a major need to upgrade public infrastructure. So the demand is there for transport, telecommunications, water supply, power generation, ports, airports, but that has to be at an affordable cost. In the past, the government here has depended upon community contributions, government's own funds, donor grant funds, notably from from Australia, World Bank or ADB lending, as well as domestic borrowing from using T-bills and inscribed stock, etc. So sometimes borrowing for state-owned enterprises, commercial investments was occurring with the EIB, IFC from the US, OPIC, and various Exim banks from the UK, Germany, Australia, Japan, and Malaysia. So some international borrowing also was occurring by the state from um, UBS and Credit Suisse, for example. And in 2018, PNG had its first sovereign bond. So although there were long established trade and cultural links with China, including some provision of sports facilities and small agricultural projects, trade and investment built up strongly over the last decade with Chinese investment in mines, and major out, 
outlet, uh, China became the major outlet for PNG's logs and uh, the major destination or a major destination for hydrocarbons, particularly LNG. From 2012, there was a real buildup in MOUs with China. Chinese construction firms set up in PNG, initially brought in by private companies with strong Chinese links, but then increasingly under the ADB financed uh, projects. From 2010, China started to provide loan finance as well, which built up during the decade to become PNG's largest single source of uh, loan finance uh, as of last year. And um, alongside the Asian Development Bank, um, albeit well behind the level of grant funding that's been made available from Australia and continues to be. PNG is also joined, but I don't think has actually had any funding from the uh, Asia Infrastructure Bank at, as yet. PNG loan financing um, now consolidated under the title of the Belt and Road Initiative has a reputation of being easier and quicker to secure with le less rigorous requirements. So that uh, some politicians and others had an upside, but it also had some apparent downsides. But the widespread perception has been that work was conducted exclusively by Chinese firms, notably state-owned enterprises, and the workforce substantially comes from Chinese workers. The costs of the contracts may be relatively high, and the standards and durability often perceived to be relatively low. But that is a gross simplification, and as we've ascertained with our case studies and, uh, and dialogue, it's widely held perception in PNG and in the region, but sometimes uh, there are certainly variations under certain circumstances. So the main characteristic experienced with case studies in PNG, they've been very difficult to ascertain the financing or the contractual details from the PNG authorities, including state-owned enterprises, let alone Chinese sources. In Indeed, state-owned enterprises, but also the government itself, have advised our teams verbally and in writing that financing and contractual agreements inc include confidential confidentiality provisions which cannot be shared. The financing is undertaken uh, under the PNG Procurement Act, but using a clause which allows it to use the donor funding the donor uh, countries' funding and procurement arrangements. In some, but not all cases, strong pressure has been applied uh, and effectively imposed in some cases on the respective state-owned enterprises, regardless of the cost, demand, and other provisions. And as with one of the case studies, the Kummel, Kummel submarine cable, there's been a very rapid rollout of a series of telecommunications projects involving one major telecommunications company from China, initially including a fiber optic cable to Sydney, although that was subsequently uh, halted and replaced by an Australian funded Coral Sea cable. But there's a, a, an apparent lack of clarity over state owned enterprise borrowing and the state's functions in terms of guarantees, liabilities, standards, responsibilities. For example, what happens when there's an earthquake, which happened with uh, the Kummel submarine cable, which broke in several places before the contract has even concluded. The financing arrangements were initially fairly poorly organized, but not very selective in the cases of, of various projects. Um, as with the PMIZ, the Pacific Marine uh, Project, which is basically to support uh, fisheries and other um, facilities, fish canneries and so on. The IS IFC withdrew from that project, with the Chinese engaged, seeing an opportunity or wanting to be responsive even in the face of clear governance issues. So those many of those issues were at the PNG end, uh, and that project, although initiated at the end of 
uh, well, around 2010, is still actually not got off the road, other than a big three million Kina gate. So some projects are of major scale, and potentially much larger than required, but at a cost that would place major liabilities and debt, debt servicing obligations on the respective state-owned enterprise, as with PNG Power um, for the Ramu uh, Hydro and potentially jeopardizing uh, Datico's finances with the telecommunications. However, as with the Western Pacific University, which is a grant funded project where local institutions have clear ideas and plans for what is required, perhaps a high level request having also been submitted to the Chinese government, there seems to be a readiness to apply somewhat more transparent processes at least from the PNG institution, some hybrid or contractor uh, implementation arrangements, higher levels of local workforce input, clear adherence to uh, PNG specified standards. So this we understand is fairly consistent with the situation in some other countries like Timor-Leste that where there is a strong um, demand for certain standards, the Chinese institutions are, are agreeable to uh, comply with that. So, uh, yeah, there's a, a few introductory comments. Thank you, Paul. And uh, so let me quickly introduce Flora here. Uh, so Flora is a research fellow at INA. And uh, she uh, was uh, served as a deputy governor of the Bank of PNG. And before that, uh, she served as deputy secretary of strategy at the PNG Department of Finance. So she has experience both in the public sector and working for civil society organizations. And then she also uh, uh, helped with uh, the case studies uh, from INA. So um, Flora here, um, can I ask you to kind of share some highlights or anything you would like to add uh, when helping produce uh, case studies? Oh, oh okay. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I'll just concentrate on the the key findings on the governance gaps on the case studies that we have already done, and perhaps on the fourth case study. And um, I think the main issues in governance gaps in Papua New Guinea on the case studies we did are um, mainly the lack of uh, transparency and accountability. Um, like, um, yeah, mainly the lack of uh, accountability, uh, transparency and accountability. Um, the, the, with the projects, the people who are coordinating the projects or managing the projects for the government, th there is a lack of consultation with the key stakeholders. And like the government, um, agents and the landowners. Like Paul said previously, the land is owned by, um, uh, they are customary landowners, traditional landowners. And 90% of our land in Papua New Guinea is owned by um, tribes and um, yeah, clans. So it's all customary land. And because if, if there is a lack of, um, consultation with the landowners, they can they can just stop the projects. So they go on strikes and they hold the projects back. And they can even go and shut down the projects. So two, two of the projects that have been done, there is there was lack of consultation with the landowners. So they shut down the projects and there were delays in the projects. There's also a lack of um, coordination between the government agents, the key stakeholders, the 
project managers tend to just manage the project by themselves. They don't consult with the government key stakeholders. And, and um, I think the main, main thing that is lacking in these projects is the total lack of information to the public. There's no transparency and there is no accountability, um, especially the financing structure um, of the projects. It's, that is not clear at all. Uh, and that was uh, seen with um, the Pacific Maritime Industrial Zone project, uh, the submarine project. And I can even see that with the Ramu 2. Uh, hydro project. <clears throat> yeah, it's, especially, especially, I mean, for projects like that and, and projects like that, they are accountable and to the public. They they must they must publish the information to the public because the public is going to in the end pay for the. Right. Pay for the uh, repay the funds. Right. So in Ramu two and especially in Ramu two project, um, there are confidentiality clauses um, in the project agreement. So they they um, those confidentiality uh, clauses prevent any publication of the project agreements to the public. Right. Yeah, and, and and in some of the a couple of the projects that we have uh, uh, gone through, um, there is also we, we have the processes and the frameworks in place. We have the legislative pro, uh, uh, framework. We have the acts in place. We have the processes in place, but um, we have found that uh, in. Uh, few of the couple in in couple of the cases there has been political influence and po political in, uh, interference on who should do the projects and um, that is like hidden um, and and because the board members are, are appointed by the NEC cabinet. and the cabinet uh, it's uh, difficult difficult sometimes for the board members to say no so they're sort of protecting their own um own what do you call it <laughs> yeah a job sir yeah and so um you know there's total there's no accountability there there's no transparency they do it behind the the, the scenes back doors and, yeah they do yeah, it yes with yeah, all that yes yeah. yes okay Sorry? Yeah, so everything is kind of opaque. So it's like behind yes, door, that's closed right. door deals. Mm -hmm. I will come back to you, Paul and Flora, um, um, later after the Q and A, and then to ask you to share a little bit more on like your firsthand experience to visit project sites and also some reactions from local communities. I will come back to you, but um, I think now because we don't have a lot of time left, so I would love. Um, to then uh, ask the first round of questions to all the panelists. I will start with Peter and then uh, Jake, then I'll come back to uh, Flora and Paul. So with Peter, um, you gave very really astonishing uh, percentage of uh, the contracts that obtained by Chinese contractors. So I am just a curious, like what's the motivation from Chinese contractors to obtain you know, or become the top contractors from all the multilateral development banks. Like what's the benefit to be like the top role builder of the world? Like why they wanted to gain market share in this space? Like how does this advance their geopolitical gains or goals? Thanks, Kathy. I guess to start with, I would channel the, the voices of a couple of um, state-owned enterprise workers I spoke to in uh, 2014, 2017, and then 2019. Um, from there's three um, three key state enterprises in Papua New Guinea 
uh, being Czech, China Harbour, uh, CCECCC, um, which is China Civil Engineering, uh, and China Rail. Now, they declared early, this was the, particularly the Czech guys, they said, we want to compete with China Rail for the Highlands Highway projects. The, the, I remember them telling me this in 2014. Um, and it was back when they were having some trouble with, with the lay port, um, particularly in 2017. They, they said, right, we've done a bit here on ports, want to build roads. And what, talking to people from both companies, they said they wanted the Asian Development Bank's money. Um, now, when I asked them why, why ADB money, um, I, I think they were being encouraged to go for that personally. Uh, and I think there's a broader reason for that. Uh, in terms of China's economic position, something big happened uh, for China and its foreign currency in 2016. Uh, it lost a quarter of it in one year, went from 4.2 trillion to 3.2 trillion. And I think this massive overseas project uh, was something that they suddenly had a bit of trouble paying for. So they've been pretty smart about it. They're getting others to pay for it. Um, but, but these people from these companies they saw an advantage in getting the ADB's money uh, because they found they liked the way the ADB operated for a number of reasons. They couldn't necessarily articulate those um, and they found them more reliable. So one company told me, um, if we're getting Exim Bank money from China, uh, it may take a very long time to get to us. If we're getting ADB money, we know on day X, we get the cash. Um, and money talks. So I, th I think they're pretty simple reasons on the ground, but I think there's also some higher level guidance as well that's to do with some economic realities. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's interesting because one thing that I've heard uh, from other people is, uh, you know, it doesn't really make a lot of sense for China, uh, like state, you know, as a state, uh, to subsidize so much in like in, into its like industrial capacities, right? So then, um, and then one explanation that I heard was that uh, China's geopolitical goal is they want to explore standards. Uh, so, but then I mean, standards does make sense in say real way in telecommunication because then these are the <coughs> the the equipment that also has standards kind of built in when you you know, build this infrastructure projects, but then the road, the bridges, you know, these, I'm not sure, maybe there's standards as well. I, 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 I'm not sure. Yeah. So I was I, just I curious. I, I don't think it's about standards at all, but I do think it's, it's probably about influence. Okay, great. Very interesting. Uh, so Jake, uh, you work with uh, so many different uh, island nations in the Pacific um, and these are young democracies, like you mentioned, and then they all have uh, governance gaps. So I wonder if there's any examples uh, that you could share that the countries have successfully improved its and strengthened its economic governance. Uh, so maybe there are implications that or lessons learned that we can kind of take. Uh, anything you could share on this front? Yeah, um, thanks for that. I, I think, I mean, the, the big answer is that there's no sort of silver bullet. And the key is really, um, as I was trying to emphasize before, that developing this ecosystem of mutually supporting institutions, especially the big three, the kind of the politics, political will, and then uh, secondly, the capable watchdog agencies. And then thirdly, um, as, as has been emphasized, the, the civil society involvement. So I think um, you know, where those have been coordinated and all uh, progressed at the same time, that's where we um, really made progress on, on economic governance. But um, I would say just in terms of, of particular methods, a few things I've just seen um, have positive impacts um, when in terms of particular um, proposed investment projects. So one would be, you know, having uh, to improve transparency through availability of data. So things like that seem uh, quite simple, but things like land registers um, in, in some countries, developing those, that's had a, um, that's really just brought 
transparency um, and reduced opacity in in an area that's that's you know land is involved in almost all of, all of these projects that we're talking about um, and then other things that might not be so obvious but about remittance tracking um, a lot of the the kind of smaller investments in some of the smaller Pacific Island states a lot of the issues uh, around them uh, uh, the potential problems are how the money is actually flowing um, and so so uh, ways of monitoring how uh, capital actually flows in and out um, are really important in building more transparency and, and capacity there. Um, another thing that I think I've seen work um, is uh, having sector plans at the at the national level, um, just to kind of have a visibility and shape to all this investor interest. So for example, with, with the Marshall Islands, um, they did this with their national energy strategy. Um, and then once you, you have that in place, it requires uh, donors, investors to, uh, there's a framework that, that means that investments then have to, um, that's out there in public, conform to in terms of the country's priorities. So that's that's been an important shaping mechanism. And then, I mean, other things that I've seen work in, in some of the countries uh, where I've had more experience, like in, in the North Pacific, um, has been sort of lateral thinking, the use of environmental um, standards and approval processes, also labor standards. Um, those have been applied to, to great effect where there haven't necessarily been focused investment um, vetting mechanisms, but the use, uh, obviously these projects have implications for the environment. Um, um, they need to use labor. Um, so that's that's been a way to uh, generate more transparency around particular projects. And actually I've seen some that, that shouldn't have gone forward not go forward because because of those those levers were were used um, and then the last thing I mentioned others have as well is just the the importance of of transparency and the role of of media there really reducing um, the risk when when you have uh, independent media who um, kind of understand the mechanics of of how investments work um, and how they're assessed they know the right questions to ask of their own government officials and of and of the enterprises they're looking to invest from elsewhere in the country. Um, so that's something they've really seen um, shed light on some uh, potentially problematic situations and, and help with economic governance overall. Thank you, Jake. So um, uh, Paul and Flora, uh, I know you guys have done some uh, field trips uh, to visit some large infrastructure projects built by China. And so, um, I'm curious if you can just, just share uh, what are the sentiments and perceptions from the communities that are directly impacted by these large infrastructure projects? And, um, and do you have any kind of recommendations uh, based on all the case studies that you have done? You know, some recommendations on how, uh, what are kind of the low hanging fruit and more viable options to push for greater transparency in PNG? <laughs> okay, thanks. Yes, as, as I mentioned, there are uh, different models that we've had here, and the general perception of uh, Chinese engagement, uh, including in the extractive sector, is, uh, and we have, for example, uh, the major Ramu Nickel project as the first Chinese investment by a Chinese state-owned enterprise. It's, um, it was allowed a 50% uh, Chinese workforce, a 10 plus year tax holiday, all kinds of other exemptions. So the wide perception is, look, what are the benefits of this project? There's very little local engagement, little tax revenue, and some environmental messes that come out. So there are a lot of, there's a lot of discontent. And in some instances, you even had the authorities with some temerity actually shutting the project down occasionally when um, spillways were leaking or, and a lot of concerns over sort of uh, when the sea suddenly turned red. Uh, oh no, no, this is quite harmless. So, um, so, there are negative concerns over these and also about how with these projects, there's this spillover. So the workforce, one minute is a workforce on a construction project or on a mining project or whatever, but the next minute 
they seem to have become uh, informal traders operating in competition with local local traders in activities which actually are restricted to uh, local participants. So there's a lot of uh, concern and negativity, and I think that that's a feature that you see currently in the crisis that's been occurring in the Solomon Islands, where with the transition that you've seen recently from Taiwanese recognition to Chinese recognition, there seems to have been a, a sweep in of, of Chinese contractors, mining operations, as well as the existing logging operations, and uh, and a concern that that local communities are jobs are not being created and local uh, opportunities are being marginalized. So that's one perception, a sort of more uh, negative perception in a way. On the other hand, of, uh, as we've said, there is a strong demand for uh, infrastructure in a country where um, you know, infrastructure is, is fairly basic and, and the politicians certainly are eager to, to sign up and, uh, and they see uh, the Chinese financing and Chinese projects are, as a faster way of accessing resource projects. And some projects, as I mentioned uh, in the clip there, um, with a certain amount of pushback, there has been uh, greater local involvement and, and greater sort of compliance. And so that um, Western Pacific University project has got a larger local workforce. And as far as I can see from the field visit that we had, there was there are good relations between the, uh, the Chinese overseeing company, the contracting company, the, the local con uh, architects, the, the university authorities. You know, everyone seems to be playing ball. I should add that we do understand that um, uh, we heard this, so can't verify this, but there's a, an understanding that there are a certain amount of uh, projects that are allowed. So each new prime minister in Papua New Guinea and maybe in other developing countries are allowed their own selected project, um, particularly under a grant arrangement. And it, we heard this in our regional meeting yesterday with the Philippines and Myanmar, that they had some of these sort of these projects as well, and that they're very closely linked with the authorities. And so that Western Pacific University was to some extent uh, linked. It's in the electorate of the former prime minister and would have been, uh, which doesn't mean that it's not, it's not a good project, but it's, um, but yeah, there are those, those linkages and that selected firm, even though the processes did seem to follow do, some level of due process, um, albeit that they, six companies were selected by the Chinese through their supervising contractor. One got knocked out because it was suggested that uh, it was using backdoor means to advance its situation. Um, but nevertheless, the company that did win did seem to have very good uh, associations with some of the powers that be uh, already in the country. So if I can just add one thing to uh, Peter Connolly's uh, comments on the Highlands Highway, it, which is that some other companies that are in the country um, have complained to me that they weren't even given a look in. They, they weren't even given an opportunity to, uh, to bid for those ADB projects. And yet there are companies that are doing major construction work and are already in country. So these are other international and, and domestic uh, firms. So those are interesting scenarios and got to follow up with some of those companies because they do complain bitterly but they do feel that there's nowhere that they can express their voice thank you flora. paul uh, flora anything to add yeah from yeah, yeah um like what paul said this this perception that um um perception that uh, the Chinese companies come over and they could take over the local jobs. And the perception from the landowners uh, is that, you know, why why are they doing the, the jobs that can be done by the locals here? And so they have this negative perception about the Chinese firms coming in. But they also say it's a good thing that they are coming in with the money and doing the projects. Uh, but we want to be involved in the projects 
we want to be involved. We, we, a lot of people in the, where the projects are, are being done, um, the landowners are not educated. This, they're not, uh, they lack the literacy and the understanding. So what they want the projects to do and the government to do and the project uh, managers to do is to, to have training programs for the, for the landowners and the local people. But that's not happening in most of the projects. Thank you, Flora. So we are uh, at time um, and to like quickly summarize what we have discussed today across uh, uh, the whole panel, I think it is important for us to note that uh, transparency and accountability in PNG and also throughout the whole Pacific um, area is extremely important, especially when there's like a huge amount of capital inflow into the region. So to build up the defense mechanism to ensure that the local voices and local stakeholders, that their voices are taken into account and their voices matter. Um, so I think the discussion today really highlight um, the need to have more consultations and to involve more local stakeholders into these kind of multilateral discussions on decisions that will have direct impact on local communities and on recipient countries. Um, so the project that P INA is working on, on uh, BRI monitor really is a great tool for civil society uh, advocates, for journalists, for all the anyone who cares about transparency or information disclosure to who care about um, you know potential financial burden that these large infrastructure project could bring on to the host government so I think this really is a good tool for people to kind of utilize um, and to really drive the point of transparency and accountability home uh, so I want to thank you all uh, for being here today and then for your um, really valuable insights uh, on the topic. I'm sure we can go on for another hour or two. Um, so I'm sure the conversation will continue one way or another, maybe in a different form. But thank you so much uh, for your discussion today. And thank you for joining us. Good night.